Again, there I am. Hey, good morning, church. What a great day it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 So good to see each and every one of you here with us. If you're a guest with us, we just especially want to say welcome and thank you for joining us today. In our bulletin, you'll notice there's a connection card. If you would, please take a moment to fill that out for us. Um, Give us your information. We'd love to follow up with you and just get to know you. And again, thank you for joining us today. If any of you have any prayer needs or praises, you can also let us know through, your, uh, through that connection card. We would love to pray with you, so let us know through that way. Also, um, if we don't have your email address, we're continuing to send out weekly email updates each week. You can write your email address on that connection card, and we'll make sure that you're added to that list, okay? I uh, have quite a few different meetings, ministries happening this week. You'll see them in your bulletin as well. Uh, today, there will be a Sunday School Leadership Meeting at 4 o'clock at the Family Life Center. This is meeting is for all directors and teachers. Uh, this evening, we will be having our youth and children's ministries from 6 to 7 over at the Family Life Center. If you know of any students who'd like to come, please encourage them to come and to join us as we study God's Word. Uh, this Monday, we do have our grocery ministry. So we will be meeting at the Family Life Center at 9 o'clock and just encourage you, if you're able to, to come join us as we pack those boxes with food and then go out to minister to many in our community And again, I just so appreciate many of you who give your time and your donations to this ministry. It's just been wonderful to minister to our community. Uh, This Wednesday, we're we're still doing our normal live stream and devotional service. We just invite you to join us. That's on our Facebook page at 1 o'clock. And then in the evening, we have our youth and children's ministries, again, on Wednesday from 5.30 to 7 over at the Family Life Center. And just a reminder, I know we've been announced in a few weeks, and the youth have just, uh, they did a wonderful job with that 30-hour famine. They finished that out last weekend, that Friday and Saturday. So this is the last Sunday that they're collecting funds to help end world hunger. So if you, would, if you feel led to give towards that 30-hour famine fund, you can make your gift out to the church and label it 30-hour famine. And then lastly, on that back table, we have a bunch of those You're Invited flyers. So make sure to grab some, some of those on your way out, invite someone to church with you this next week. Okay, again, just a blessing to be here this morning, to be in the Lord's house. Let's go ahead and go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for another day that you have blessed us with. Lord, we thank you for the ability we have, Lord, to come to gather in your house, to come to worship you in song and praise and through the studying of your word. Lord, I thank you for each of these here, my brothers and sisters, Lord, that are here in person. I thank you for those who are joining us on the live stream too, Lord. It's just such a blessing to, Lord, to be here to worship you together. Lord, I pray you be with uh, Brother Mark, Lord, and and the worship team this morning as they lead us in song and praise. And I thank you for Pastor Greg, Lord, and for the message that you have put on his heart. And just pray you'd speak through him, speak through your word with your spirit this day. Lord, may we open our ears and open our hearts to hear and to receive what you have for us this day, and may we apply it to our lives, Father. Lord, we just pray you continue to use us as your church to be your hands and feet, to show your love, to share the good news of Jesus to all those in this community and around the world. Again, we thank you for this day, and we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. It is a blessing to be here. We're so glad that you've come to join us this morning as we worship the Lord and as we remember all that Jesus has done for us in Ephesians 1, 7, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin in accordance with God's riches and his grace for us each and every day. So let's stand together as we worship the Lord at Calvary. Years of spin and vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died. And Calvary, mercy that was great and grace was free, pardon that was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty. At Calvary, by God's word at last my sin I learned, then I trembled at the law I'd spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary, mercy that was great and grace was free, pardon that was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Now I've 
give to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy that was great and grace was free. Pardon that was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that your salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did spend at Calvary. Mercy that was great and grace was free. Pardon that was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Sing together, Blessed Redeemer. Up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walked Christ my Savior, weary and worn. Facing for sinners, death on the cross, that he might save them from endless loss. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems how I see him on Calvary Street, wounded and bleeding. For sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Father, forgive them, thus did he pray. Even while his life blood flowed fast away, praying for sinners while in such woe. No one but Jesus ever loved so. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems how I see him on Calvary Street. Wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unhealed. Dying for me. Oh, how I love him, Savior and friend. How can my praises ever find end? Through years unnumbered on heaven's shore, my tongue shall praise him forevermore. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, how I see him on Calvary Street, wounded and bleeding for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying. We want everyone on the same page. <laughs> you got it?
wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, He the perfect Son of Man. In His living, in His suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hell-bound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law, in him we stand. Come behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery slain by death the God of life, but no grave could e'er restrain him. Praise the Lord, he is alive. What a foretaste of deliverance, how unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected, as we will be when he comes. What a foretaste of deliverance, how unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. Open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 14. We are going to read that whole chapter today. So I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able. And knowing that it is a long chapter, just uh, wanted to prepare you. Right from the beginning, chapter 14, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi." 
Ha-Haroth, between Migdal and the sea in front of baal Zephon, you shall camp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, What is this we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped by the, at the sea by pi ha in front of baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us? In bringing us out of Egypt. Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness. And it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided, and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh, that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus, 
The Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful for your word. And in particular today, this account of great deliverance. We thank you as we look at the Israelites that in their fear, they still did go forward. And they saw the work of the Lord that night, throughout the night, and the next morning. Lord, may we learn from this passage today. May we have lives that are ready, eyes open to see the great deliverance that you provide for us. Be glorified today through the reading of your word and our study. And again, we pray by your spirit that you would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I love football. And we're not in football season yet, but I'm looking forward to Labor Day weekend. That's usually when the big games start kicking off. But you know, you watch a football game and you will see the quarterback often coming off the field, and he will put on a set of headphones. He's not listening to music at that point. In fact, he's probably talking to the offensive coordinator of his team. And this offensive coordinator sits somewhere high up in the stands, and he has a bird's eye view of the field. Now the quarterback himself is down in the midst of the action, but he cannot see everything as clearly as his offensive coordinator can see. And with the advent of computers and and camera work, they're constantly taking pictures of the field, how the defense lines up against the offense in a given situation. And that offensive coordinator, through those headphones, talks down to the quarterback, preparing him for the next time he goes out on the field. For the quarterback... And for the team, it is good to have someone high looking low to give advice. And I think about that spiritually. For we are really, the defense in our case, is Satan trying to attack us. But we have God who sits high and looks low. The issue is this, do we have a connection with Him? Do you know how to put on your headphones and talk to God? It's called prayer. It's called even resting in His Word and listening. Because God wants to connect with us. If we don't have that connection, we will get sacked in the backfield every time by Satan. Now I want you now to think about beyond us into our passage this morning. What had Moses become for the people of Israel? He was their quarterback. And he needed the direction of God. He needed that connection with God to lead the people out of Egypt, now they're in the wilderness, but to lead them forward toward the promised land. We see in these verses today, beginning in verses 2 through 4, the Lord is carrying out the plan that He has in place. He knows exactly what Pharaoh will think. He plans to harden the heart of Pharaoh again so that God will gain glory. We move forward, verses 5 through 9. The things that God has predicted are now coming to be. Pharaoh overtakes the Israelites as they are camped by the sea. Then in verses 10 through 12, we see that Pharaoh, excuse me, fear has overtaken the Israelites. They are in terror as Pharaoh and his army are coming ever closer. The Israelites voice their fear. They voice their objections to Moses. Why did you bring us here? Did you bring us to die? Could we not have died in Egypt where there were graves? But in verses 13 through 14, Moses stands up as their leader. He says, stay strong. He says, in fact, you will see the glory of the Lord this day. And I don't know, while while you're reading, while we were reading together, if you get this, you won't see this menace that you're looking at now, tomorrow. The Egyptian army will be gone. In verses 15 through 18, we see that God makes his plan known and he he tells how it will end again, to his glory. In verses 19 through 20, the angel of God 
moves to the rear. This is a great picture for us, and we'll talk about it more in a moment. The pillar of cloud moved to the rear in a beautiful act of protection, separating the Israelites from the Egyptians. Then things really start to happen. In verses 21 through 22, Moses is told, stretch out your hand. And as he does, the Lord begins to drive back the sea with a strong east wind. The Israelites pass through the sea with a, water of wall, a wall of water to their right and to their left. Verses 23 through 25, the Egyptians pursued God, but God threw them into confusion. If you read it, depending on what translation you read, there are slight variations to describe what was happening to the chariots. You could say that their wheels fell off, they bound up, they were clogged so that they could not pursue the Israelites as they wanted. Verses 26 through 28, at the Lord's command, once again, Moses stretches out his hands and the sea comes back over the Egyptian army. Not one survived. Last verses we read, verses 29 through 31, when the people saw what had happened, they put their trust in the Lord. They put their trust in Moses. Well, there are several truths to learn from our passage today. The very first is this. Sometimes we will be called to do things that we do not understand. In verse 4, reading from the NIV, it says, so the Israelites did this. In the ESV that we read today, and they did so. What is this phrase referring to? It's referring to the fact that God had called the Israelites to turn back and to camp. That was probably the furthest thing from their mind. They wanted to escape. They wanted to get away from this Egyptian army. They didn't know why they were turning back, and they probably wondered why they were doing such a thing in this land. But the Israelites did it, even in the midst of their fear. In a study in Cleveland, Ohio, coroners examined the hearts of 15 assault victims who died after their attacks, even though their wounds had not killed them. They weren't life-threatening. A man by the name of Charles Hirsch, he was one of the researchers, researchers concluded this. 11 of the 15 victims had torn fibers and lesions in their hearts, most likely caused by mortal fear. Mortal fear. They died because of what they feared might happen, but it never did. The study proved that scared to death is more than just a casual expression. If fear, think about that for a moment, if fear can put a stop to life, literally, what can fear do to us when we are called by God to do something? It can cause us to take roads, our paths, or to sit very still instead of going forward or sitting still as God calls us to. It can cause us to do the exact opposite of what God wants in our lives. We are afraid at times of being alone. We're afraid we'll have no resources. We're afraid to look foolish when we fail. But even if we do fail, God promises us to use that for our good. And when God promises us to be with us wherever we go, there should be no fear that keeps us from walking forward through doors. Is there a door that God is calling you to walk through? Is there a moment that he's calling you, hey, stay here for just a minute? When is the last time you acted blindly and obediently to the call of the Lord. There are times we will be called to do things we don't understand. Number two, sometimes the Lord will call us to follow difficult instructions from his anointed leader. I'm referring now to verses 10 through 12. The people of Israel had been given instruction. It was not what they wanted to hear. These were difficult instructions for them. But I come to this question, is there doubt I should say it this way. Is there any doubt that God had called Moses to be their leader? Now for us, we can say very easily, we see this progression. We know that God has called Moses to lead the Israelites. Had he been given a vision of deliverance from God, 
Absolutely. Again, we can see that. Well, then we have to go back. How could the people have known that? How could the Israelites have known that Moses was working for God, was working at the command of God? Well, sometimes it's difficult. But there are several things to look for. One is look to your leader for a heart of ministry. And even in Moses' life, very early on, Moses, if you go back to the early chapters of Exodus, Moses intervened when an Egyptian was mistreating a Hebrew because he had a heart for his people. He acted in such a way. Look also for a genuine concern for the people. Moses had a genuine desire to lead Israel out of their captivity. Number three, look for a record of faithfulness. If you look closely at Moses' life, there is that record of faithfulness. It's repeated over and over again. Now think about it in this sense. We have just worked through the ten plagues. But at each plague, Moses would go and make the proclamation of what was going to happen. And it happened. Just as Moses said, just as God gave it to Moses to report to Pharaoh, it took place. And even when the plague, when Pharaoh decided, this is enough, I want this plague to end, he would speak to Pharaoh or to Moses, and Moses would say, for instance, when would you like it to end? And then I will pray to God. So there will be no doubt that Moses and God had a connection. God was using Moses. So we had before the Israelites this record of faithfulness. Fourthly, he acknowledged the Lord. Verses 13 and 14, I just want to read them again. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord. Not of me. He is pointing out the Lord is in this, which He will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Moses was very direct and giving credit to God for the deliverance that was to come. Now, I want us to think about this for a moment. Sometimes the Lord calls us to follow difficult instructions from the anointed leader. And I want you even to know, uh, look at what we're in right now, the COVID situation. As I look out, each of you are wearing masks. This has been something that has prayerfully come to the conclusion. And I will tell you now that even though Texas opens up, I have no intention to open up immediately. We will be, begin progressing. But that is what God has given me as the leader of this church. And if you, and I don't mean this in a bad way, because this can go for any church. When you call a pastor, you call a pastor that you trust, I would, I would hope, or it's time for him to be gone. And I just want to prepare your hearts to know we're all excited. We're all ready to be back to normal, but we will do it in a progression, a, uh, this transitioning from where we are now to a place that we are more open, being able to do more activities here. Sometimes the Lord calls us to follow difficult instructions. Number three, there's a time to pray and there's a time for action. Can you say amen? amen. There's a time to pray and there's a time for action. There was a heavy snowstorm that came through a town. The children were out of school for several days and one grade school teacher asked her students when they came back, how did you use the time? Did you use it to be productive? And one little girl said, I sure did. I prayed for more snow. <laughs> That's being productive, isn't it? Well, prayer, prayer is by no means the least we can do. But we don't need to hide ourselves behind what sometimes may be even false piety to avoid doing what God calls us to do. And, and I'll give you an illustration of that. Say someone comes to you and they have uh, just an opportunity for you, maybe in ministry. They ask you the question, and what is, our, what is our response? We should, if we are not ready to give an answer, say, well, I'll pray about that. But let it be a truthful statement. Don't let it be something you just an act because you're so pious. Let me pray about that before I give you an answer. There's a difference. Now, I'm going to tell you, tell you this too. There are times when someone comes to you and you can give an answer immediately. Immediately. Why? Because your life, if you are in a spirit of prayer, you have no doubts. 
And I'll give you an example. Someone called me just about two weeks ago to ask me about something, and I was able to say, I, I, I do not feel comfortable doing that this time. But it was because of my spirit with the Lord, I had that freedom to say no. And that is a freedom that comes. The psalmist writes it this way, delight yourself in the Lord, He will give you the desires of your heart. And I think when we're walking that closely, and you get something to come up to you that comes to you that does not fit in that mold, it's okay to say no at that time. Other times we need to pray, but not in a way that you're hiding. Pray to truly hear, hear the voice of the Lord and know with your mind what He wants you to do. There's an old saying, pray like the outcome depends upon God, but work like it depends on you. There are times to pray there are times to move. And you think, well, where are you getting all this? Look at verse 15 with me again. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Moses had spent time with God. He didn't need to keep crying out. What do we do now? God said, stop crying out. Go forward and lead these people. There's a time to pray and there's a time for action. Number four, God can be counted on for protection while we walk with Him. Verses 19 to 20. Then the angel of the Lord, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. And here's the picture I have. This, this cloud moved from behind. And on one side of it, there was darkness. And on one side, there was light. Who do you suppose was walking in the light? The Israelites. Who do you suppose was walking in darkness? The Egyptians. I want us to know that there are times when evil, the things we fear, are close enough for us to touch them. That's how close the Egyptians were to the Israelites, close enough to be touched. But God places himself in between us and that fear, that terror, that which would harm us. And the secret is to stay in the light. The Egyptians were in darkness. We too often choose to walk in the darkness by, by the path that we choose. We choose to stray away from God into darkness. I want to share a prayer with you today. And it, it's the words from a Puritan prayer, so the language is a little bit different than what we would use. But it's just a very powerful prayer. This, this prayer says, I am deeply convinced of the evil and misery of a sinful state, of the vanity of creatures, but also of the sufficiency of Christ. When thou wouldst guide me, I control myself. When thou wouldst be sovereign, I rule myself. When thou wouldst take care of me, I suffice myself. When I should depend on thy providings, I supply myself. When I should submit to thy providence, I follow my will. When I should study, love, honor, trust thee, I serve myself. I fought and correct thy laws to suit myself. Instead of thee, I look to man's approbation and am by nature an idolater. Lord, it is my chief design to bring my heart back to thee. Convince me that I cannot be my own God or make myself happy, nor my own Christ to restore my joy, nor my own spirit to teach, guide, and rule me. Then take me to the cross and leave me there. And it is at that cross that we find our protection. Again, God can be counted on for protection when we walk with Him. Number five, when we walk closely with the Lord, God will always receive the glory. Have you ever noticed something going on in your life and someone will acknowledge it and you're able to say, it's because of God? And I'm sure those moments have come up at some point in your life. Look at this, this passage with me. Verse 25 Let us flee from before Israel, right at the end of the verse, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. The Israelites didn't have to say a word, did they? They are fleeing. 
They didn't have to say, ooh, on you, the Lord's fight for us. They didn't have to say a word. Because as they were being directed through the Red Sea, God was fighting the battle. The Egyptians did not need to hear a word, and yet they are able to say, let us flee because the Lord is fighting for them. God got the glory. The Egyptians knew it. And when our lives regularly display supernatural activity, God gets the credit. When our lives display actions that no one can, can understand, God gets the credit. Number six, a growing faith strives to believe without seeing. We know the popular expression, don't we? Seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. The Israelites feared the Lord and they put their trust in Him because of what they had seen. Verse, verses 29 through 30, But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in His servant Moses. It is, it is often that when we see that we fully place our trust in the Lord. I think about the person who has gone in for what is to be a critical surgery. And they may go in with fear. And when they come out of the other side and they are delivered from what might be described as an impossible or miraculous situation, they say, man, God was good. Well, God was good already, wasn't He? But sometimes it takes us seeing things to put our faith and to, to, to uh, speak that very faith. In John chapter 20, Jesus has gone to the cross. He died there. He was buried. He was resurrected to life. And in John chapter 20, Jesus reveals himself to Thomas after the resurrection. And at that point, Thomas finally believes. And Jesus says to him, because you have seen me, you have believed Blessed, this is, this is the key right here, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's, that's us right now. We, we were not there to see the crucifixion. We did not experience the resurrection by sight. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. God is calling each one of us towards a sightless faith. Do you understand that? He calls us to have sightless faith. We don't have to see to believe. We, we can hear. Hear the word of the Lord. Have that proclaimed to us and we can believe. There was a businessman and he had to travel to a small town. And he invited his wife to go, wanted her to go with him. And they were both very excited. But when she found out that they were flying on a small twin engine Cessna, she said, honey, I've decided not to go with you. What? Why not? He said, well, I'm not going on a little bitty twin engine plane. Her husband smiled and he said to her, honey, your faith is too small. And she quipped, no, the plane is too small. <laughs> well, the man really wanted his wife to go. And so he canceled the Cessna flight and booked flight on a major airline. His wife went with him because as she put it, my faith grew because of the size of the airplane grew. You know, the object of her faith determined how much faith she decided to have. What is the object of your faith? It's God. We, the object of our faith is so big that we can have Great faith, sightless faith. And that is what God calls us to. Let's stand and pray together. Lord, we are grateful for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning for worship. And I pray that we would each be encouraged and challenged toward that sightless faith, that we would be growing in our faith. Lord, I pray for each person here today 
for each of us watching the live stream or the recording playback, I pray that we would all be challenged with that truth. And I pray it begins by asking, do I have a faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for me, who was resurrected from the dead three days later and lives today? Have I have a, do I have now a relationship with Him? A relationship that promises eternal life. Lord, I pray for each person here that they've never asked if they've never asked you for forgiveness of sin and that relationship that I just spoke of, that they will do that today. I pray for those you've led here to make a decision. I pray for those that you led here to turn over some area of their life to you. Maybe there's something that has so overwhelmingly encompassed them or grabbed them that they need to come and pray at this altar to say, Lord, take it from me. In faith, I give it to you. Lord, I pray for your spirit to move during our time of invitation. If you've led anyone here to make decision, give them courage to step out this day. Give our watchers the courage to call this church and seek counsel from someone about the decision that they have been led to. Lord, may your spirit move now as we sing and have our time of commitment before you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. If you have a decision to make, need to pray at this altar or come and pray with me, you are invited to do that as we sing, I Surrender All. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live i surrender all i surrender all all to thee my blessed savior i surrender all all to jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all, all. To Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. As Sam mentioned, I invite you back for Wednesday live stream at 1 o'clock. Sam will actually be leading that this week, so tune in to hear how he will encourage you through the devotion. Again, so glad you are here. You are dismissed. Amen.